banging it out. Nice. All right, got it. Devin, here we go. Let's do it. What are we going to talk about tonight? I think we're doing a continuation on our last one, of weight loss fallacies. Okay, so what's the new, what, what other fallacies do you have for us? Um, so should we recap the last ones? If you'd like to, yes. Yeah, so the last one, we talked about how like cutting out a specific food or food group doesn't automatically create a calorie deficit. Um, the other one was like making sure your expectations and efforts align or not having uneducated expectations, like not creating your weight loss expectations from like Woman's World magazine or right, Dr. Raj, who's running for office. Apparently we found yeah. this out the other day, right? Yes. And then the third one was just thinking that exercise burns a lot more calories um, than it actually does. And then people exercise a lot thinking they're like burning a thousand calories in their orange theory class. And then they don't lose weight because they're not creating the calorie deficit. So basically, but exercise doesn't burn as many calories as people think is the, that was the third one. Okay, so what are we going to add on top of that? Uh, what other layers of the, the fallacy lasagna are we going to pile on? Um, so a couple of the ones that I thought were a little bit more unconventional, or maybe they're just a little bit more like mindset focus or just people okay. asking themselves the wrong questions. But I think one of them that has come up a lot is people ask like, oh, does this work? Like does using a crock pot work for weight loss? Does uh, this cardio equipment, does it work for weight loss? Does this diet work for weight loss? And it's like, it's not whether it works or not. It's understanding how it fits into the bigger picture. Can you explain, yeah. can you unpack that a little more as yeah. in academic circles? Yeah. So, <laughs> well, I, th I thought of it the other day, cause one of my clients was telling me how she she just bought a new crock pot and how her mom gave her a hard time about it because she's like, well, last time you had a crock pot, it, you, you didn't lose weight. It didn't work. So why are you going to buy a crock pot again? So, and like what I was explained to her is, was that Wait, there's two crock pots now. Well, I guess an old one she left, she lost a long time ago, but anyway, so the what I was explaining to her was that it's not whether the crock pot works or not for weight loss. It's more about she's getting it because it's going to make cooking her protein a lot easier. And if she had, if her protein is easier to cook and more convenient, then she's going to be more likely to eat it consistently. And then if she eats the protein more consistently, then that's going to have an effect on her appetite, her energy, her cravings, um, blood sugar, and like all the things that can have a really big effect on overall um calorie management but what you're telling me is it's more about how you use the tool than necessarily the tool itself right that just because i own a hammer doesn't mean that i'm bob vila from this old house or norm abrams or whoever runs that show now right yes okay now the reason why i'm thinking about this the other day because i got an argument with somebody because that's what i do all the time and someone said, well, if they had a million, like millions of dollars, they would be in shape too. And I'm thinking to myself, having worked in a, like a very wealthy town as we both have, um, the one thing you know about money is it just simply tends to make people bigger versions of who they already are. So if you're eating like a lot of calorie dense junk food on the budget you're currently on, the odds that all of a sudden you're going to turn everything around without establishing the habits first hire a personal chef and have that personal chef make you like delicious lean protein and vegetables. It just, it doesn't seem to pan out in the reality of human beings, at least not consistently. Do you know what I mean? Totally. You'll get that personal chef and instead of having them make grilled chicken taste delicious, uh, they'll, you want to have making them creme brulee every night. You'll be bigger than ever. You look like Brando, right? And the doctor of Island Moreau, doctor, the Island of Dr. Moreau. Not that anyone knows what that means, but Marlon Brando was this actor. If you ever look him up like an on the waterfront, the guy was a total stud. And then towards the end of his life, he like gained hundreds of pounds, right? Because he just kept eating. The point being, I'm, I'm getting too, too many non sequiturs here. The point being is, it, yeah, you're right. It's the tool. It's not the tool. It's how you use it. Absolutely. Right. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And then another, that, that, that another story, it, it happened at the gym. I wrote a training program for this woman and she came in and she's like holding up the paper. She's like, is this going to work? Is this going to help me lose weight? And so what I explained to her was that it's the strength training is part of the whole picture, but there's 
the diet aspect, there's the lifestyle changes, there's consistency, there's how you're doing the training program. So it's, yeah, just going off of that. It's not just, does it work or doesn't work, but how does it fit? And are you going to do it consistently? So could we say, I've seen people do Orange Theory Fitness who have lost weight. I've seen people do Orange Theory Fitness who have not lost weight. I've seen people do Weight Watchers who have lost weight. I've seen people do not do Weight Watchers and not lose weight. I've seen people do the zone and lose weight, not, you know, do the zone and not lose weight. Every single thing you could imagine, I've seen somebody do, and one person succeeded and another person's failed. I think this kind of just reinforces what you're saying over and over again is it's not the tool, it's the person and how they utilize that tool and whether they can utilize that tool effectively for themselves. Yeah. Exactly. So, what do you think drives that? What do you think drives that, that, that desire to seek Excalibur, to seek that, that, that one universal tool that rises above all else? What, what do you think the motivation behind that is, Devin? Um, I think it's like a human, it's this, it, this is probably something like psychology people have studied, but I think it's part, part of it's that. Psychology people, you mean psychologists? Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. <laughs> I know there was like a country called psychology people. They were like walking around neurotic all the time. Please go ahead. Um, it's probably something that, something that like is the default human way to try to figure that out. And then also it's like pounded in people's heads that like in infomercials or on social media, like this is the thing. No, this is the thing. And it's just, so people are like, okay, if if I'm supposed to be looking for one thing, that's like, that's, that's in their mind of like what they're trying to seek out. Yeah, I think it's human nature to try to find an easier way of doing things. Yeah. You know, and in some ways that worked out great. Look, we have toilets on the inside of our house instead of the outside of our house, right? We have, we have cars instead of riding horses or walking. So in a lot of cases, the human desire to make an easier way of doing something has worked out very well. The problem is when it comes to weight loss and exercise, a lot of times it backfires. I've always said that if the Wright brothers were bodybuilders, the airplane would have never been invented because they would have been doing walking lunges across Kitty Hawk. You know what I mean, it's like, and it's funny thing is, I always tell my clients, because we work like in a university town, is I always tell them, guys, for a second here, you got to turn your brain off. Your body is constantly trying to find an easier way, more efficient way of doing that. And unfortunately, when it comes to exercise, a lot of times trying to find the most efficient way of doing something isn't always the best way to do it. Sometimes the most inefficient way to do an exercise is what's going to put the most tension on the muscle and it's going to give you the least amount of leverage, right? So it's, I think that, I think it's, it's driven from a, a very noble place, but a lot of times it backfires, right? And plus people are busy. Exercise isn't their thing like it is with us. So if they can find a quote unquote hack that allows them to achieve equal or close to equal results with less efforts, so they can focus on the things that really are important to them. Um, they're going to try and do it. The unfortunate problem is most of those hacks don't really work very well. Now, putting the ice cubes on top of your protein powder in your protein shaker, that is one life hack that works. But most of them really just, they want to blow it up in your face. Yeah. I don't think it's necessarily a negative thing. I think, you know, look, if someone can figure out a more efficient way of doing things, fantastic. It just, it doesn't ever really seem to work is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Crockpot's a good example though, right? The crockpot, you can set it and forget it. You can put your meats in there. You can put your, your, like, for example, what's two of your favorite crock pot things you like to make that uh, are simple? Chicken breast and chili. Okay. So you take chicken breast, you throw them in the crock pot. What else do you do? Oh, well, the chicken breast, a jar of salsa, throw it in the crock pot on high for four hours. That's it. Yeah. There's no other steps. That's it. Well, then once it's done, you shred it. But that's usually you just put the forks in there and it falls apart, right? Yep. What's your favorite kind of salsa? Salsa. Um, I guess I like Jimmy Smith's and he did a great episode of on Saturday Night Live once where he went to an office place and because everyone knew he was Spanish, they were over pronunciating their Spanish pronunciations to yeah. try and make him feel more comfortable. And all it did was make him feel uncomfortable. So please go ahead. I like the Publix brand, like generic medium salsa. Okay, here's my question for the rest of us who are not, and I'm not being facetious here because I, you know, my pub, my love of Publix. Publix is a grocery store that's in the South. I think the closest one to here, and this is how much I love it because I know it is in Virginia. If you don't have access to Publix, which is by far the most superior grocery store chain I've ever been to, what other types of salsa do you like to have? Do you have any other types you like that aren't Publix, like that are more name brand? 
Oh, like name brand. Um, like Joe's, which has a little like bit more of a. Tostitos or. Okay. So it's okay. You don't need some kind of special low carb salsa. No, just. Okay. Any salsa. And literally you just put the chicken in the crock pot. You put the salsa on top of it. You put it on high for four hours. And then it's this shredded, delicious protein packed meal. Yep. That's fantastic. Well, I mean, you would have it with, with side, like a carb and a vegetable. Right. But the point being is that's a hack. It's a simple thing that you figured out to do that actually works. So it's not that all hacks are bad. It's just some are way better than others. What's one other crock pot meal you like? Uh, chili. But that's like you cook it in the, the pan or the pot and then the crock. You brown it first? It, yeah. But like you brown the meat and the peppers and onions, but then everything else goes in the crock pot. The crock pot just makes it a million times better. Like it's not- What's the, it do? Like all the flavors to centralize? Is that what it does? Yeah. Kind of just like the meat and the sauce- kind of come together and form more of like one, like one unit. Like Austin Powers with the fembots. There's like a cross mojinization, right? And then all of a sudden it tastes better. Sure. Okay, there you go. All <laughs> right, so what else? What's another foul? Did we milk that fallacy for all it was worth? Is there anything else you want to I talk about so. with that? No, that was the main, I got my main point across. I think that was. Excellent. And I got a lot of not very main points across. So let's go to the second fallacy. What's the other second fallacy you want to talk about? Um, the second one, it kind of goes along the same lines as like work or doesn't work, but people think that whatever their efforts are, that they have to have this big dramatic outcome. Like it's the same, probably partially human nature, but partially fed by these like commercials with someone wearing pants, like twice their size and like holding the pants out. And you see this, like big dramatic difference but like it's like someone can start start eating a little bit more protein eating a little bit more vegetables they can start exercising and it, you can be putting effort in and it be you don't have to expect this dramatic change like you're gonna have to have these behaviors going in place for a long time so you're gonna have to be able to do them without one having these huge expectations but also like people wait until they're like, well, I don't want this like big dramatic thing. It's like, you can still, you can still make some positive changes in your life without needing to have this huge dramatic outcome. I, I get it. You know, I've read stories about these people who are on the show, the biggest loser, right. And they lose all this weight and then they gain it back. And there was one story, but one of the guys, he went on a weight loss diet and he was upset because he only lost, I mean, I get this wrong because I'm doing this from memory. It was something like he lost four pounds in a week and he thought he was a failure because on the biggest loser, he was losing like 18 pounds a week. Right. Mm -hmm. It's like these crazy unrealistic, realistic expectations are, are, are thrust upon people based on something that's made nothing other than for, for good television. Yeah. Right? Or they see again, speaking of this guy again, who now we found is running for office, Dr. Oz, <laughs> right. If I was debating Dr. Oz, you know what I would do if he's my political opponent, I'd literally go buy every magazine, Woman's World magazine, right? That has like lose 20 pounds in 10 days. And every time they ask me a question about my opponent, I would just hold that up. Like, you're going to put this guy into office. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't even know what the guy stands for. All, all I know, he could stand for a 100% tax break for Mike Crookshank. I have no idea what his policies are. But I think even that alone, I'd have a hard time voting for. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, that's what I would do. So, yeah, people are constantly forced at this idea of these insane outcomes when it comes to weight loss. And then they put that little writing on the bottom that says, you know, results may vary. Yeah. They really may vary. The, the Really the big thing, the main reason I brought it up is because I think it just prevents so many people from starting and so many people from staying consistent because they have these huge expectations. And it's like, it's like, oh, well, if I start exercising, what if I don't change my diet? Or what if I don't, what if I don't make any other changes? It's like, you can start exercising and not make those other changes yet. Maybe you're only, maybe you're only ready to do one thing at a time. Like it's okay to start and do a little bit without, and just like get your behavioral momentum going without having these big expectations. Well, it's interesting because there's an analogy I used with a client once that really stuck. And I said, look, think of your life as a stovetop and you've only got four burners on it. And one burner may be your job and one burner may be your family and another burner, maybe the things you like to do that keep you motivated enough to keep doing your job and taking care of your family. 
And then there's that fourth burner that you can dedicate towards diet and exercise. But it's one burner. How many things can you put on there? Right? If you look at Olympic athletes, they put them up in the mountains of Colorado. Why? Because they need as many of those burners clear as humanly possible. They need them separated from their family so there's a burner. They can't have a job so that burner is separated, right? They, they can't have these outside stresses outside of peak performance of the sport. They need all four of those burners open for cardio, technique, diet, and, and strength training. But you all, sometimes you only have so many outlets for energy if you're not the, the, the Nietzschean Uberman, for lack of a better word. And, and that's maybe the best you can do. So maybe it is a matter of you start the exercise without the diet or you start the diet without the exercise and understand this is all part of a process and that the results may not come as fast as you want them to because they can't possibly come as fast as you want to because there's a reason why the biggest loser is not filmed in the houses and the apartments of the people that are on the show. There's a reason why they put them out on a set, separate them from everyone else, give them their own food and then have them do what, six to eight hours of steady state cardio a day. None of the stuff, if you're doing six to eight hours of steady state cardio a day, that's like two burners on a four burner stove right there. You're just not going to go to work all day because you got to do cardio. Do you know what I mean? Like, I, I get that. That's absolutely true. It's, it's, it, it's, it's another unrealist expectation. You know, I remember there was always this thing when I was growing up, you know, that moms would stay home and raise the kids. And then there was this whole thing that, no, women, women can work too. Awesome. And then there was this whole thing that, like, women can work and raise kids. And not only can you do it, you have to do it. Right. I think I got that knowledge of Mom McDonald. He made that once on a podcast. You know, it became the point where these people were like killing themselves to do everything when the reality was they were trying to do six dishes on a four burner stove. You know, some people are genetically geared and wired to to have six burners on their stove. And I'm happy for them. They're probably the CEOs of the world. Right. Everyone wants to be a CEO until it's time to do CEO things like work, you know, how many hours in a week, hundreds of hours a week, maybe as many hours in a week, but whatever. You get the point. Um, some people are wired that way. I'm not. That's why I have to have lists and daily to-do lists to kind of push me and structure and, and, and kind of focus my day on the things I need to do. Because if not, I'd just sit around all day looking at dog videos. Like literally, that would be my default. Eating Snickers ice cream bars and watching dog videos. I could literally be like, spend the rest of my life like that. Wasn't there like a movie where they did that with the characters where everyone was overweight? They were in like these little, what was that? It was a robot movie. And everyone in the future was overweight and they, and then these robots took care of them and they, they drove around on like these little space carts and all they did was eat and watch TV all day long. This was a movie. It's a movie. It's like a Pixar movie. I can't remember it. Someone in the audience, not, I, I'm not really big into to cartoon movies, but I haven't. I'll, I'll figure it out. Go, what go, So What else did you want to say? Cause I'm that the burner analogy is all I got. Um, well, actually I thought of another one, as you said that, like the, misconception that there's disciplined people and undisciplined people it's like oh i'm just an undisciplined person so but and like fitness people are disciplined people regular people are not and it's not it's not this like black and white thing like you said if you didn't have your structure your lists um you you would be eating snickers bars watching dogs ice cream bars snickers ice cream bars much like empire strikes back are one of the few sequels that surpasses the original. It's very true. Right? Snickers ice cream bars are the real deal. Please go ahead. Sorry. I, I, I get very, I die on very bizarre hills. I apologize. Go ahead. <laughs> but I think that a lot of people hold themselves back by creating these, this identity for themselves. Like, oh, well, I'm just not a disciplined person. Well, I'm not a fitness person like you. And like well I wasn't always a fitness person like you you build the discipline over time it's something you build it's not something you just have um so I think knowing that whether if you're not disciplined about diet and exercise now it's that's changeable that's something that you can build into your life so here's an, the name of the movie it's Pixar's Wall-E all right. So if anyone wants to go see what the, the, the dystopian version of the future would be, that would be it. Pixar's Wall-E. Right. And I, I get that. You're right. I think people have a misconception. Like one of the things we're going to talk about today, you don't beat yourself up. And I think one of the misconceptions people have about fit people is they never eat junk food, that they never go off their diet, that they never emotionally eat. Right. I'll give you an example was I was helping my client, Naomi, move uh, some furniture the other day. The next morning I went in the shower, I slipped in the shower and I popped my hip. It's an old wrestling injury I had. 
After I popped my hip, my entire back locked up. I got so sad and depressed about my entire back locked, locking up. I ate an entire box of chocolate covered pretzels she had given me for helping her move, right? Literally four or five days later, I was back to my regular weight. Why? Because after I got my bearings about me, after I'd gotten over the old wrestling hip injury, after I had, you know, got my act together, I went right back to my regular schedule and those chocolate covered pretzels wound up getting, wound up being a, a, a grain of sand in an entire desert of my diet. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Right? So that's a perfect example of that is that people sometimes have these misconceptions of what fitness is and that fit people are organized and driven and, mo- and some people are. I know some people will do one rep of an exercise and they want to do the next one and the next one and the next one. But that's not the case of everyone who's really fit. And that's definitely not the case of everyone who gets things done. A lot of times these people, majority of their life is on autopilot. They schedule certain things for certain times in certain ways and certain days because they may not have that internal drive or they may be trying to do so many things that it's impossible to do it all without very, very clear plans. But uh, yeah, I think that's a great point. I, I, I think that is very important to understand is that so much of your life in, when it comes to weight loss, it's automated and it's just simply what you do um, or that it's scheduled and written down that, that it's not, I think I, there was an analogy when someone said life is complicated. There's too many things to think about in life. Breakfast shouldn't be one of them. You know, I think it was an advertisement for something. I can't remember what it was, but reality is I never think of my breakfast, right? I have like three breakfasts that I eat. They're always prepared ahead of time or set up ahead of time, or they take less than a couple minutes to make. The other day I saw a chef and she was making like couscous and turkey bacon and scrambled eggs with chopped up sauteed vegetables. And it was beautiful. It was a stunning meal. It was almost as stunning as the nutritionist. But the only problem is I then woke up the next morning and I was all like, ah, this is what I look like in the morning like that. Like I have like one eye that doesn't work. And I literally just rolled out. I was exhausted. I wasn't sauteing any vegetables or mixing them with eggs in a pan, even if they were pre-sauteed. I wasn't making any turkey bacon and then reheating it with couscous. It probably would have been a breathtaking meal. But then the, the mental state I was in that I had to be out of the house in 30 minutes and go train somebody, I threw a, a cup of oatmeal in a bowl. I threw two cups of water in the same bowl, microwaved it for five minutes, pulled it out, put in a tablespoon of honey, a scoop and a half of protein powder, stirred that son of a bitch up, and then ate it on my way to work, Right. It's got fiber. It's got a ton of fiber. It's got a ton of protein. It's got flavor in it from the protein powder and the honey, right? But it was realistic to who I am first thing in the morning. Yeah. Just like it's realistic that the meal she was making was probably spectacularly breathtaking better than my oatmeal. I'm not getting that done. Not not when I have to rush out and go see a client. Maybe if I have an off day and I'm sitting around and I have nothing to do, yeah, maybe that'd be a wonderful thing to do. But... Again, realistically for me, I'm not sitting there eating, you know, raw vegetables sauteed in extra virgin olive oil with, you know, a side of avocado for breakfast every day, you know, with organic pasture fed eggs. It's just not, it's not going to work. Right. So uh, you're right. They have unrealistic expectations in a lot of things, especially what kind of foods are diet foods. But I've seen people eat, I've seen people lose weight off of frozen dinners. Which you would never, oh, there's so much sodium, there's no process, there's all this thing. It's like, look, there are calorie controlled, portion controlled meals that literally you pull out of a box and you microwave. The problem with most processed foods is people eat too many of them, right? But if you don't eat too many of them, they're basically a great way of controlling calories. So, I mean, I've seen every, and it goes back to your original point. It doesn't have to do with the individual. It's not the tool, it's how the individual uses the tool. Mm-hmm. If you use processed foods to overeat, then yes, they will cause weight problems. But if you use them because they're a convenient, easy way to get the nutrients in you need and control what most people are terrible at, which is estimating portion sizes, it, it, it's, it's, it's going to be, it could be a huge plus for you is all I'm trying to say. Yeah, definitely. Should we go on to our next point? Please go ahead. I have no idea what's go, what's coming next. You 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 had all these awesome fallacies you came up with, and I was like, let's talk about the importance of pain. And I'm like, all right. <laughs> uh, so the the whole like spot reduction myth. Oh Jesus! Oh God! Okay, please go ahead. Yeah, I mean, just thinking that, and I know you've probably had this many times. Like people come in the gym and they they want to work out, and then they want it to be like, if they want to lose belly fat, they think they're going to be doing crunches for their whole workout. They want to lose 
arm fat, they think they're going to be doing arm exercises the whole time. Um, when in reality, you can't choose where you lose, like body fat loss happens at more as a whole. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's that you can't, I mean, that, that, that's such a heavy subject. I, 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 the other day I flew into one of my, my rages. I'm really glad I'm not like on a show like big brother where there's cameras in my house. Cause I like see something on like Instagram and I literally get up and pace around my house. and I make these faces and I get really angry. Cause I got to get it out of my system. There was a video of this woman who was so ripped and so muscular. It's like the first thing I was like, when was the last time this woman had a menstrual cycle? I mean, she shredded. Right. And she has this, used car salesman smile right and so like right away the average consumer doesn't stand a chance she's shredded and has that smile right and she's doing all these ridiculous like ab exercises like this and she's going mm -hmm. i can't because i don't have that face right i got like my face and she has her face and, and like no one's gonna, her abs yeah her abs and she's pointing at like this area of the low back where is one of the most notorious areas where people store body fat right and she's like these are the five exercises that are going to help you. They do this thing where like the music is playing and they're going, they point at like the part of their body and they make this stupid I, face. Like when they have that like nose hair that's like misaligned. Yeah. That, right? You're trying to pull that nose hair out. You're like, Doink. they're like this. And, and then she shows these five ridiculous exercises and all these people are commenting like, wow, if I do those, I'll get abs like her. And it's like spot reduction doesn't work. Like literally she's lying. Like Instagram, so and Facebook's so concerned with fact checking. Like, could they do some fact checking, right? Body, body fat checking, maybe. Like, stay off the political stuff and, and get rid of that that garbage, right? But I'm looking at this. I'm thinking the average person now. What are they going to do? They see her body. They see that smile. They see her enthusiasm. Anyone who says anything about her is a hater, right? Mm -hmm. But the reality is that she's peddling absolute lies and garbage, yeah. right? She's the she's. She's the queen of refuse if you're a fan of uh, Princess Bride, right? And it's driving me nuts, but that's what's out there, right? And, and there's no talk about, you know, alpha versus beta fat cells, right? Receptors on fat cells. The idea that, you know, how come when a man loses weight, his face looks gaunt and sexy, but then he has this big Buddha belly, right? And how come when women lose weight, they get shredded abs and arms, but their triceps carry body fat and their thighs and buttocks carry body fat? Right, because it, you, you can't sexify the concept that not all fat cells are created equal. And some fat cells are literally genetically designed to be more stubborn to burn off, right? The last thing the human genome wants is to die out, right? I know it doesn't have a consciousness, but you get the point, that's the way it's designed. So it's not gonna make every fat cell easy to burn, especially if you're a woman, the area of the thighs and buttocks, because that's where you need to get your body fat from to, to, for nursing, right? Men, it's the same thing. Why do you have big Buddha belly fat? Because we need to have our internal organs protected because, you know, grocery stores didn't always exist. So you had to go out in the wild and kill stuff. And if something took a swipe at your unprotected guts because your rib cage only goes so far down and we do walk up on our feet, so we're incredibly vulnerable. I'm talking out of my anthropological ass right now, but you get the point right? There's a reason why we store body fat in certain places and the human body knows that and it makes it very difficult to burn that fat. Welcome to the human race. Welcome to the fact that there are some people who don't have those different types of, I don't want to get into the, the anatomy of this, but they don't have those stubborn to burn fat receptor cells. So they're all of a sudden, it's really, really hard for them to lose weight in certain places. And then these fitness professionals come around and they act like you can do an exercise. And the reality is you probably have to get down to single digit body fat as a male and probably down to very low double digit body fat as a female, literally most likely losing your menstrual cycle to be able to get the fat out of those areas. That's the only way the human body would mobilize that fat because it literally thinks you're in the middle of a famine. And at that point, you're not sleeping at night. Your sexual function is gone, right? Because the last thing the brain is gonna let you do is reproduce when you don't have enough food to feed yourself, right? So it's like, it, it, it's so pervasive in our industry. Can we just say once and for all, spot reduction does not work. It can't work because all of the areas that you want to spot reduce fat, they're not the same type of fat cells that are in the other areas of your body. They're just not built the same. They are built with a fail safe and they make it harder for you to burn. Because again, human history has been one of poverty, not of surplus. We, readily accessible food is not the norm in our existence.
right? So our bodies are designed to protect against that. It doesn't, your body doesn't care about bikini season or skinny jeans. It thinks you're literally going into a famine and it's going to do everything it can in those exact areas that you want to spot reduce to keep it from losing fat. Because again, the fat in the spot reduction areas is not the same as the fat in other areas of the body. Mm-hmm. You know? yeah. And that's where the genetics come in. Cause a lot of those people who have those genetics who lose fat in that area or don't get it in that area in the first place, right? They're, they're, they're built differently. They're literally built from the ground up differently. You can't train that. Yeah. Right? No one in the right mind would ever think that if you ran fast enough, long enough, you'd be as fast as Usain Bolt because everyone knows that's genetic. But when you see women with six pack abs and no body fat on their thighs and buttocks, and it wasn't because they got surgery, you have to understand that's just as genetic as, as Usain Bolt running the speeds that he does. Right? Unless you're going to do an immense amount of suffering upon which most likely your body is going to is going to commit mutiny against you in the first place, it's just not going to work. Right. Sorry. That, and that's what I do around my house when no one's here. I just walk in circles and do that. I <laughs> complain about this. Yeah. But yeah, I'm, I'm watching the video and I'm like getting into it. I'm like, yeah, she looks really good. And I'm like, what am I doing? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Okay. I'm exhausted. Go ahead. Take over, Devin. Uh, and I think it just like with the, with the whole spot reduction thing, like knowing that, I don't know, like, like if you build muscle overall, especially in your, in the larger areas, if you eat enough protein, you move a little bit more. If someone's like not very active, um, those things are all going to do a really good job at helping you lose body fat. Devin, do you have a number? I know we're not nutritionists, so we do not legally prescribe anything. But in your observations as a personal trainer for as long as you've been doing this, in your observation as a fit person who has been doing this a very long time, when we say get enough protein, are there specific numbers that you tend to see work better overall? Like um, what does that mean in terms of grams of protein a day? Do we know? I would say somewhere like the general recommendation is like 0.7 to one gram per pound of body weight, but a mm-hmm. lot of people can go a little bit lower. So like, I know you've talked about like half, half your body weight in grams of protein. Yeah. The the actual data is supposed to be, now this is where, when you actually personal train regular people, it's different than say training athletes. The Mm -hmm. actual stats always refer in pounds of lean body mass. So they'll always say something like 0.75 to one gram of protein per pound of lean body mass. The problem is, is when you're working with an average everyday person, they have no clue what their lean body mass is. And most of the most accurate ways to measure body fat, they're either not motivated to do or they're humiliated to do. So they really have no idea what their lean body mass is. So in the beginning, I always go with that lower number of 0.5 to 0.75 is that I've seen be successful for most people. We've had this discussion before. Most people don't have a taste for protein until they earn a calorie deficit long enough and they actually get hungry enough, right? Most people will probably take the lower end of the spectrum. So 0.5 is better than anything. And because they don't know their lean body mass, giving them that kind of number probably works more successfully because it, they're probably going to hit towards the low end of the ratio. So therefore, it's probably going to reflect more their lean body mass versus their total body mass. So even though the science says that, I very rarely follow it because my observations, not my prescriptions, because I can't do that, my observations are that people tend to succeed when they're overweight or they have weight to lose with around 0.5 to 0.75 grams per pound of body weight. And when they start getting leaner, 0.75 to one gram per pound of body weight. And the reason why is when you have more body fat on you, your body will preferentially go after that for energy than it will for protein, right? So I always make the analogy of baby back ribs. Only a fool would eat London broil if he had access to baby back ribs. Now, look, I understand for certain religious reasons, turn them into beef ribs. It's not the point here, right? So the point being is even to the human body, fat seems like a much better alternative. But when you drop enough body fat, all of a sudden, now all of a sudden you got left is essential body fat, which again, is not going to let you spot reduce away or muscle. And that's what happens is you see the leaner somebody gets, it seems to be me, it seems to me, in my experience, the more protein they need. Again, this is provided they've talked to their doctor, They've checked everything out. I've always said this, dead people do not lose weight. They decompose, right? But once you've checked with your doctor and make sure you're healthy enough to do this, the leaner you get, your protein demands seem to go up because you need that much more to preserve lean muscle mass because you don't have that 
You ever see the movies when the evil guy uses someone as a human shield, right? That's what muscle does with body fat. When, when your diet's shooting bullets at it, it's like the evil guy who uses like the woman and her child as a human shield. That's what, that was a horrible analogy, but that's what your body, your muscle uses body fat for. Well, guess what? When you drop body fat, there's no more human shield to protect you, right? So then all of a sudden it starts going after your muscle. And what's the most, what's the best protein sparing nutrient there is? Protein, right? So that's why the demands tend to go up. Right. Now, a lot of people I know who are successful with high fat, high fiber diets or high carbohydrate, high fiber diets that don't use a lot of protein. The one thing I notice over and over again, they tend to lose a lot of muscle when they lose weight, even when they resistance train. Um, a lot of them tend to be more cardio based people. I mean, I'm not saying people aren't successful with those kind of diets. What I'm saying is I've observed they tend to lose a lot of muscle when they follow them. Because once you drop, and again, it's not within the first 10 or 20% of body mass loss, but once you start going deep down that weight loss rabbit hole and your brain starts thinking, wait a second, we're no longer in a surplus. Now we're getting famine zone. Muscle starts becoming the next possible victim. And so that, that's a big deal. To, I think it's a big deal for people to have specific numbers to know exactly what they're trying to shoot for every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I think the basically the, the point I was trying to make, even though you can't choose where you lose, you can still eat and train in a way that helps you lose body fat. And when you, when you lose enough of it, you're going to lose it from those, those stubborn areas. Yeah. Eventually, right. Your body has no other choice. Yeah. Or the rest of you is going to look so good. You're not going to really care. Yeah. You know, you know, when my life's not going so well, all of a sudden, like the, 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 the you know, the one like thing in my house, I don't like bothers me a heck of a lot more. And then when things in my life are like, when I have the dogs over here and I'm having a good time, like there's just some things I don't even, even notice about my house that I don't like. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it, once you start getting in shape and you feel like you're in control of something, sometimes that stuff doesn't bother you as much. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Oh, oh. But thanks for getting back to the point because I actually completely lost it. I apologize. <laughs> it's okay. We we'll do that. So we have a minute left. We really? Yeah. Oh God. All right. We can't get cut off again. Devin, finish us out. Um, what should I, I mean, we, we, didn't beat, we didn't cover beat up yourself again. This is fantastic. This is going to be the ongoing joke. Every episode we're going to say, we're going to cover, don't beat up on yourself too much. And then we're never going to cover it, but then we're not going to beat up on ourselves. So we'll be the best living example of that. What's what, what do these people need to know? We've got 40 seconds left. What do they need to know? Well, you can't spot reduce body mm -hmm. fat. You like it's not about if something works or doesn't work it's more about how you use the tool yeah what else you more. aren't born a disciplined person you have to build discipline yeah some people are but a majority of people aren't right yeah. and some of them may be the most successful people you know right yeah i think that's it i just want to say i want people to know that i'm grateful for these calls i think this is a fantastic resource for people to use to help them in their weight loss journey and i think we just got to keep making them yeah i agree all right, so Devin, you're going to record this and then you're going to put this up on your site. I'm going to cross promote it on my site, on my YouTube channel and on my Facebook page. And we'll go from there. In fact, okay. I'm not going to put it on YouTube. I'll put it on Facebook. You're going to put it on YouTube, right? Yes. 